Hello! Today I'd like to talk a little bit about neuro-ophthalmology. Now I will admit, when I was a resident, neuro-ophthalmology uh, was probably one of my weakest areas, especially my first year. And I think that's probably the case for most residents going through an ophthalmology training program because neuro-ophthalmology is hard. Now actually it's not that hard, but it is kind of hard to learn and there is a lot of conceptual stuff here, and so I've actually broken this lecture down into two parts. Not because neuro-ophthalmology is particularly more important than some of the other subjects we've talked about, but it is somewhat conceptual, and I wanted to slow down, take our time, and try to do this right. So in this first part, I'd like to talk about extraocular movements and nerve palsies. Now, uh, before we can really talk about the cranial nerves and how they affect the eye, we really need to understand the muscle anatomy uh, before we can understand the movement. So if you think of the eyeball, sitting inside the eye socket, there are four rectus muscles. And these rectus muscles attach back here in the back of the eye socket uh, at the annulus of Zen, and then they come forward and attach to the sclera of the eyeball itself. And these rectus muscles are kind of apart from each other, and they go in directions you expect. There's a superior rectus, an inferior rectus, a lateral, and a medial. So these aren't hard to memorize because they are labeled where they are and for the most part by their actions. So if you look at extraocular movements for the eyes you can think of the lateral rectus out here to the side, superior, inferior, and the medial rectus. So if that was all there was to eye anatomy, man this would be easy. But the problem is it gets a lot more complicated. Here's why. We also have oblique muscles. There's a superior oblique. This muscle starts way back here at the annulus of Zen comes all the way forward along the uh, inner wall, the medial wall of the eye socket, goes through a little pulley here, this pulley is the trochlea, and attaches sort of in the back of the eye. So we'll go over this superior oblique muscle because this is probably the most confusing part. There's also an inferior oblique muscle which uh, doesn't go through a pulley, it actually attaches to the floor of the eye socket, but it also attaches to the back of the eye. And these oblique muscles make things very confusing. Now the superior oblique, I showed how it went through this pulley here. This pulley effectively changes the direction of this muscle movement. And so I think it's probably conceptually the easiest to consider this pulley, which is up here at the bridge of the nose, uh, as almost like the functional origin of that muscle. And if you think of it that way and don't think about the long course it travels, it's going to be a lot easier to conceptually visualize how this muscle moves the eye. And you can see that the muscle wraps from this pulley around the back of the eye and so it has both an intorsion uh, twisting of the eyeball so the, the top of the eye moves in that direction and twists the eye and also has some up and down motion as it yanks the back of the eye up and around and so it makes the eye look down but we're going to go over the superior oblique muscle in more detail in a few minutes because it gets really confusing so if we look at our new eye model we now have our rectus muscles moving the eyes in all four directions as expected the superior oblique pulls the top of the eye over and intorts it, and the inferior oblique does the opposite. Now it does get even more complicated, and here's why. If you look at a CT scan of the eye socket, and let's advance this a little bit, you can see that the eye is sitting here inside the eye socket, and the way I like to think of the eye is kind of a, like a scoop of ice cream inside of an ice cream cone. And if you look at the cones, you can see that the eyes, the, at least the cones of the eye, the eye socket, um, or the orbit is not pointed directly in front of us. It's actually tilted a little bit out to the side. So if you think of the medial wall as here and here, you can see that for the most part, the left and the right side uh, medial wall is roughly parallel with itself. And then these lateral walls, uh, there's a zygomatic bone, etc., is about of a 45 degree angle here and here. And so you can see that the eyes have to turn a little bit in order to have both of them in perfect alignment. Um, because of that, the superior rectus muscle, which basically attaches back here, wraps forward onto the eye, um, actually has a movement of both it pulls the eye upwards, but also attaches a little bit out here to the side, so that when that muscle contracts, the eye has a tendency to look a little bit out to the side as well. And the same thing over here, the superior and inferior rectus muscles attach a little bit off axis here, and so when they tug, not only do they move the eyes up and down, but they also kind of move them in the outwards directions. So if we update our eye model, now we have the lateral medial rectus like usual, but the superior rectus not only pulls it up a little bit, it pulls it a little bit out just because of the anatomy of that eye socket. And the same thing with the inferior rectus. 
Okay, well, it's getting a little bit more complicated, but still not too bad until you throw in that superior oblique muscle. And those obliques can get very confusing. So if we look at uh, the same axial CT, and of course here's our eyeball and our eye socket, there's a medial rectus muscle, lateral rectus, this is the optic nerve. We'll advance it a little bit, we're moving up the walls uh, towards the top of the head, and you can actually see a muscle here that's attached here and is wrapping around the top of the eyeball and behind it. And this is the superior uh, oblique muscle. Starts back here, comes forward, hits that pulley right up here at the bridge of the nose, wraps around the back of the eye, and it's right there. Now you can imagine that this muscle turns the eye depending upon what eye direction the eye is looking. So imagine here's this gentleman, you're looking off here to the side. This muscle, when it tugs, if you're looking in this direction, is going to spin around this axis, is going to intort the top of the eye, and um, it's going to intort it. But you can imagine that if maybe you were looking over here, that if your eye was looking in this direction, that when this muscle tugs, it doesn't so much intort it, it actually pulls the back of the eye up and around and actually makes the eye look down a little bit. So the action of this oblique muscle depends entirely upon what direction you're looking, if you're looking lateral or if you're looking medial. So what that means is that that superior oblique, not only does it intort this eye, it also pulls it down a little bit, and so you can think of this little direction right here being the superior oblique. Now this is getting really confusing at this point, because if you think about it, this is the cardinal directions of eye movement, what the different muscles do. Now I remember as a medical student, I used to carry around one of those little near cards, and I always had a little cheat sheet on the back, and on that cheat sheet it had the different muscle directions, and I would look at that thing over and over and over and I was like, there's no way I'm going to memorize these different directions. I mean, it doesn't conceptually make sense. Well, anyway, the good news is you really don't have to memorize these things. I mean, it's going to come with time. The most important thing is just to chart what you see. So when you look at someone's eye movements, you just chart it. And this is how I chart it. Um, basically, I just draw a couple X's with a line through it, and I write down how much eye movement they have in all directions. If they're perfectly normal, you write 100% everywhere, and you chart it. If they have decreased movement in one area and one direction of gaze, you just write down they have 50% movement. Don't worry about what muscles involved. Just write it down. You can always sit down later and spend an hour thinking about it if you want. Just write it down. And this is my system that I prefer. Um, and you notice that there's no up-down on here because there's up-down. There's not really an up-down because those superior rectus muscles pull things over there and the inferior is over here. So these are more the cardinal directions. In fact, some people like to write it like an H. Um, which is the same thing, and they use a different scale where zero is completely normal and a minus four is no movement, and the eyes are something along those lines. If you want to use a percentage scale or, or this scale, I think this one's easier to memorize, but anyway, whatever you want to use. But the point is you're, you're checking it in sort of an H fashion. So when you look at someone's eyes, here's a little example. So I'm looking over here at the H, I bring my pointer up, check all the cardinal quadrants, and you know, when I look at eyes, I like to look at uh, one eye at a time first, and that's what we call a adduction. How does one eye, how well does that right eye look up, down, left, right, cardinal directions? And then I like to look at the eyes as a whole together. Uh, so one eye is deductions, both eyes together are what we call version. So converge to the eyes, look inwards when they're reading a book, or diverge. Um, but uh, anyway, just chart it. Don't worry too much about the, uh, the exact muscles. Uh, are you confused yet? Well it may make more sense to uh, actually look at the cranial nerve palsies. Certainly you chart what you see and you can try to figure out what muscles involved but you know most of the time when someone has double vision or their eyes are in poor alignment it's not because one particular muscle is out. It's usually because there's something going on with one of the cranial nerves and the cranial nerve palsies especially three, four, and six give very characteristic uh, eye findings and you can often figure it out um, just knowing what these things look like.